Welcome to Virology. My name is Vincent Racaniello, and I will be your professor for this virology course. I've been a professor at the medical school here at Columbia since 1982, and I have a lab there that does research on viruses. And the reason I'm teaching this course, I think this is the sixth year that we've been teaching this course, is that I think, well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, viruses are amazingly important for your well-being and your health, and you need to know about them. You need to know about them to understand how they make you sick, how they transmit, and why you should be vaccinated. I happen to be incredibly passionate about viruses. I like them better than almost anything in the world. Maybe except my family, I would guess, right? <laughs> and I want to convey some of that passion to you. I think they are amazing. In fact, I carry a picture of a virus on my cell phone because I love them so much. And that reminds me to take a picture of you before I go further. So I, every year I take a picture of this wonderful class to remember it. And the guys in front get to be highlighted, right? So I want to convey that passion to you. I want you to understand how viruses work. So I'm doing this for the love of viruses. I think it's really important uh, that everyone understand this. We live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. This room is full of them. You are exhaling them. If you go to the bathroom and you urinate, you will excrete tens of thousands of viruses in your urine, pretty much every one of you. And then when you flush the toilet, it will aerosolize, and the next person will inhale it. This is, not, this is nothing unusual, and it's fine. It doesn't make you sick. The surfaces of this room are covered with viruses, especially that doorknob. Um, if you go to a hotel room, the TV remote is full of viruses. They are everywhere. They infect every living organism on the planet. If we don't know a virus of a particular organism, it's simply because we haven't uh, discovered it yet. So on a daily basis, not only do you touch viruses all the time, but you eat them in your foods. Uh, vegetables, for example, are full of viruses of insects that feed on the vegetables. Cabbage is a notorious one. If you like coleslaw or any cabbage product, it's t full of viruses from the insects that feed on the cabbage. And these are not bad for you. They pass through your intestinal tract. But they do have nucleic acid in them, and we're very good at taking up nucleic acid. So they're probably contributing to our evolution. And finally, probably the most amazing thing is, that is our genome carries virus genetic material. And we'll talk about that a little bit today, but much later uh, in, in another lecture. So basically, they're all around you, probably more than you ever realized. And in this course, we're going to address what they can and can't do. The numbers of viruses on the planet is amazing. And I just want to spend a little bit of time telling you about this. The strategy for virus survival is to make lots and lots of progeny because most of them get inactivated for one reason or another. You know, viruses are floating around in a room like this. Not every one of them is going to be successful in finding a host. So they make lots and lots of progeny. In the oceans alone of this planet, there are over 10 to the 30th bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. 10 to the 30th. This is a huge number. You can't even imagine how big this is. So I'm going to help you imagine it. In a teaspoon of water from the ocean, there, there are millions of virus particles. Now the weight of all these 10 to the 30th phages exceeds that of elephants on Earth by a thousand fold. You could do the same thing with whales if you want, but these animals are getting extinct, so I'm going to have to change my metric at some point. Perhaps a better analogy is to line them up head to tail these 10 to the 30th particles, they extend 100 million light years. Th that is really far. You know, the closest galaxy to us is a couple of million light years away. And here's a reference for that calculation. So the point of this is to emphasize how many viruses are on the planet. These are just phages in the ocean. It doesn't even take into account uh, the viruses uh, on land. Whales, for example, these are big mammals. They're infected with viruses. They live in the oceans, of course. And they're often infected with this little virus here on the lower left. This is called a Khaleesi virus. It's a small RNA-containing virus. You'll learn a lot about those in this course. And these cause what you may know as the cruise ship disease, the gastroenteritis caused by noroviruses. Those are Khaleesi viruses. 
So whales get infected with them. There are gastrointestinal illnesses in whales as well. And these animals excrete every day 10 to the 13th virus particles. That's per whale. So there are tons of these in the oceans. And whales, of course, are the only one of the many uh, mammals and fishes and other organisms living in the oceans as well. Now, the, part, the number of viruses in the ocean is amazing. And this kind of emphasizes the point that not all viruses are bad. Viruses got to be studied initially because they cause disease. And a lot of our research is actually biased because viruses make us sick. But it turns out that most of the viruses on the planet don't cause any disease in us, at least. And here's another great fact. There are more viruses in a liter of coastal water than humans on the planet. So they outnumber everything. If you look at the viruses in the ocean, in terms of biomass, that's the pie char chart on the left here. So uh, viruses are in blue. You see, they're, they're not very much by biomass in the ocean. The, the prokaryotes in yellow uh, outweigh the viruses. But if you look at abundance, just particle number, the viruses in blue, 94% of all the particulate material in the ocean. They, they outnumber uh, protists uh, and prokaryotes. This turns out to be very important. So all these viruses in the oceans that I'm telling you about is incredibly important. I think if you took them all away, if you could somehow remove all the viruses from the ocean, we'd have a serious impact on life on Earth. And why is that? Well, the, the reason is shown here. Viruses drive global cycles of all sorts of material, carbon cycles, uh, oxygen, nitrogen cycles. We used to think maybe 20 years ago that uh, you know, in the ocean there are lots of phytoplankton. Uh, these are taken up by grazers, they're eaten by grazers, and the grazers are eaten by carnivores. And in all of these processes, uh, dissolved in particulate organic matter, that's DOM and POM, are liberated. So for example, when the grazers eat the phytoplankton, uh, these materials are liberated. They sink down into the ocean, and there the heterotrophic bacteria use them to produce uh, molecules like carbon dioxide. Many of them produce oxygen. 20% of the oxygen on Earth comes out of bacteria in the ocean. And they produce other organics that we need. And this is a huge shunt. We call this the, the virus shunt because now viruses are known to tap into this pathway. They infect uh, many of these phytoplankton and they generate a lot of the particulate and dissolved material that we thought was simply generated by the grazing. So the viruses have made a new shunt here. They generate a lot of this material that the heterotrophic bacteria use. There are this many infections per second with viruses in the ocean. It's a huge number. It's more than 10 to the 30th. So many infection, this many infections of viruses infecting the phytoplankton and other bacteria as well. And again, that liberates organic material that's used to generate uh, these organic compounds. So they have huge impacts on what's going on on the planet. Here's another example of a big number in terms of viruses. There are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on the planet right now at this moment. We know this because we know there are 34 million people living with HIV at the moment, and we know how many genomes they have in them. 10 to the 16th. Another huge number. That number is so big because of the way viruses mutate as they replicate. And this is something we'll talk about uh, quite a bit later on. The population of viral genomes is quite varied. So in this 10 to the 6th genomes, there are viruses that are resistant to every one of the antivirals that we have today. So we have about 30 or so antivirals that are used to treat HIV infections. In the pool out there, there's resistance to all of them. And it's just a matter of them arising. But the, the scary part is there's also resistance to any antiviral that we could ever make. And you know, we can't make an infinite amount or an infinite number of antivirals. So it's a finite number. It may be hundreds or thousands or 10,000s in the next hundreds of years. But we already have resistance out there because that number is so big. So when we talk about viruses, the numbers are really a huge part of their uh, lifestyle. How many of you have had a virus infection in your lifetime? Raise your hands. So you should all be raising your hand. Maybe you're shy not to raise your hand, but in fact, we all have. You're all infected right now in many different ways. So you all have probably all of these herpes viruses in you. You acquire them very early in life, and they don't go away. The genomes remain in you. And you don't have disease. The genomes are there. 
they're not replicating, but periodically they replicate and, you cause, and they cause disease. So for example, the herpes simplex virus is type 1 and 2. You, typically you acquire these shortly after birth from your mother. You could acquire them during birth or from your mother kissing you. Those may cause an, inter, uh, an inapparent infection, but then the viruses go latent in your peripheral ganglia. And then periodically they will reactivate, start to make virus particles, and you may get a, a fever blister on your lip. Um, and that is the form of the virus causing disease, and that's how it's transmitted to another person. Uh, varicella zoster, her human cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, and other herpes viruses all do similar things. They infect you, they go latent, and then they are reactivated at different times. And that's why they, that's how they transmit. If they weren't reactivated, of course, it would be a dead end. So over 95% of the population is seropositive for all of these viruses. So it's a good chance that most of you have uh, all of them in you. But in addition, you have many other viruses in you as well. If you take blood from all of you, we can find other virus particles circulating. As I said, you excrete uh, viruses in your urine that are present in your kidney. But these, for the most part, are not harmful. Now, many of you probably know that we have a microbiome. We have bacteria that reside not only in our gut, but in our mouth and on every surface of our body. So this is actually a map of the different bacterial populations on different parts of our skin. So you can, these pie charts simply tell you uh, what kind of bacteria are present in these different areas. And you can use this forensically. You can tell who was on a typewriter by just looking at the bacteria on the different keys because not only are my finger bacteria different from yours, but each of my five fingers is different from one another. But that's bacteria. I suspect that viruses have a similar distribution. I think we have a virome, maybe not to the extent of bacteria on the skin, but certainly in our lungs, in our intestines, and other organs of our body. This hasn't really been studied very much. Most of the attention has gone to the microbiome. But I think you'll see in coming years more emphasis on understanding the virome. Because it's in us, it's not making us sick. So just like the microbiome, it's probably beneficial. Our genome, as you know, our DNA genome is 3.2 billion bases, and about 8% of that is viral. And that's this part up here labeled LTR retrotransposons. We'll talk about those uh, later on. These arrived in our genome by virtue of a virus infection, and then the nucleic acid of those viruses integrated into our DNA. And these infections happened not 10 years ago or 50 years ago, but many, many thousands of years ago, probably before we were homo sapiens, probably some of them in our uh, primate ancestors. Yet they've been maintained, and we can figure out how many millions of years they've been in there. So the idea is they must be doing something. And in fact, we have good evidence that many of these retrotransposons do beneficial things. They also do cause some harm because they can inactivate genes and cause mutations. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about those later on. I, I find it amazing that of all the DNA in the genome, one and a half percent is protein coding. You know, we used to call the rest junk before we understood uh, how important it was. So we'll come back to these LTR retrotransposons that are part of your genomes. So you can see that we have lots of viruses in us. I've just tapped the surface, but most of you are healthy. So you have over a dozen viruses in you at this time, but you're fine. And the reason is we have this great immune system, which part of which is diagrammed here. And if you took Moschewitz's immunology course, you'll understand that. We will touch on the interaction of viruses with this immune system in this course. But if you've taken the, the Moschewitz immunology, you'll be much better off. This immune system is great for controlling virus infections. In fact, viruses have evolved with immune pressure so that there is a, a, a sort of arms uh, there is an arms race that occurs, but there is uh, also a good uh, means that we reach. Now, you do get sick periodically, so sometimes the viruses win. You get a cold, you get influenza, uh, or other viral diseases. But most of the time, the immune system takes care of it, unless the immune system is down. So sometimes this system gets compromised. You can be immunosuppressed. For example, if you get an organ transplant, they have to give you drugs to immunosuppress. Otherwise, you'll reject the organ. And when that happens, often after uh, transplants are done, the patients develop herpes viral infections. Because again, you all have herpes viruses in you. And let's say you need to get a liver transplant, you'll get immunosuppressed, 
and then those herpeviruses will start to replicate and your immune system can't deal with them. Another way to be immunosuppressed is to have a virus infection. Measles virus immunosuppresses you. It replicates in immune cells and therefore you end up getting lots of other infections, not just viral but bacterial infections as well if you have measles. And of course the most famous immunosuppressing virus is HIV. HIV which replicates in CD4 positive T cells makes you unable to repel any infection and that's usually the cause of death at end stage AIDS, uh, opportunistic infection. So the immune system is incredibly important for keeping all of these viruses in us in check and I'm, I'm not saying that we understand how it works but this is the reason because we know if you take the immune system away uh, then we have problems. So not all viruses make you sick. This is going to be a theme throughout this course. Even though most of the research that's been done on viruses has been driven by viruses that do make us sick. So it's kind of biased our view of viruses. Here is a virus. This is one of the viruses that's in your urine. It's a polyoma virus. And again, these viruses replicate in your kidneys. You acquire them at some point early in life, probably by inhaling aerosols generated by flushing toilets or contact with people. They replicate in your kidney, but you're fine. And you periodically excrete uh, many, many thousands of these viruses in your urine. You can actually trace, these, these viruses come in different flavors. And you can trace the migration of humans using the different types of this virus that infect you. So on this map is the migration of peoples from their origin in Africa. Uh, the dotted line shows the movement of humans, homo sapiens, uh, out of Africa into Europe and Asia and, and the Americas. So that's based on genome sequence. We now have enough genome sequences of everyone that we can tell who moved where. The, the solid line is tracing the movement of populations based on what kind of this uh, polyoma virus they have. Because again, you, you get infected at an early age and you keep that same virus. It doesn't change within you in all the years that you're living. You pass it on to your kids and so forth. And if your family migrates, then we can trace you that way. So you can see this dark line follows the same line as the, that one created by genome sequencing uh, out of Africa uh, into Europe and Asia. But you can also see there's more detail. We can see the movement into Australasia here and into South America as well. Information that we don't have yet from the genome sequence. So this is an aside just to show you what we can, what we can do with this information. But the point is that these viruses are at every one they're not pathogenic, again, unless you get immunosuppressed. So this particular virus, uh, it, many people take a drug to treat their multiple sclerosis. It's an immunosuppressing drug. And some of those people, this virus replicates and goes into their brains and causes a, a very serious neurological disease. So again, not a problem unless uh, you are immunosuppressed. So let's talk about a couple of examples of beneficial viruses. Uh, because, again, I want to emphasize that they're not all bad. And one of them that I really like is a virus of plants. This is a plant that lives in hot areas, like Yellowstone, the hot springs that are there that are 50 degrees or 60 degrees Celsius and higher. These plants will grow there. Uh, it's called Dicanthelium languinosum. It turns out that you can take this plant into the lab and grow it in the lab at 50 degrees centigrade. It will grow just beautifully. And of course, most plants will not grow at that high temperature. The reason the plant can grow is because it's colonized with a fungus. And that's shown here, Curvularia protuberata. It's a fungus that is within the plant, and it allows it to grow at high temperatures. If you take the fungus out, you can do that. The plant will die at high temperatures. But even more interestingly for us, because this is not a course on fungi, these fungi that colonize this plant are themselves infected with a fungal virus. And that virus allows the plant to survive high temperatures because if you just put the fungus in the plant without the virus, the plant will not grow at high temperatures. So this virus benefits the plant in some way that we don't yet understand and allows it to grow at high temperatures. There are lots of examples of this in nature with viruses of plants and insects, but what about people? Okay. Are there good examples of this? And there weren't really any good examples until uh, this one, which was published just a few weeks ago. It's not people, but it's, it's a mammal. It's the mouse. 
And it's a very interesting experiment uh, which shows that an enteric virus can help keep the beneficial functions of gut bacteria. So if you raise mice notobiotically, that is in the absence of bacteria, they're sterile. They have no bacteria in their gut or anywhere else in their body. When you do that, their intestines get messed up. So here are some sections of small intestines uh, on the top here. And here is a normal or conventional mouse. And these are normal villi uh, and mucosa. And here is the germ-free animal. You can just see by your eye that these are messed up. The villi are not proper. The morphology is wrong. So they're morphologically aberrant. But also, these mice don't have enough T cells. So the T cells are stained here by an antibody to a protein called CD3. So the T cells are brown. Here are the T cells in a conventional mouse. You can see them in the villi. Here's a single villus at the bottom. If you look at for T cells in the germ-free mice, you can see there are very few or none at all in these sections. So there are two problems, having no bacteria in your gut, your, your intestine is morphologically aberrant, and your T cell numbers are skewed. If you infect these mice with norovirus, murine norovirus, so humans get infected with norovirus, that's the cruise ship virus, it makes you have gastroenteritis. But there's a mouse strain that doesn't cause the same disease. But you know that mice don't vomit, by the way? interesting factoid. You give them norovirus, which makes people vomit, the mice never vomit. But anyway, if you infect germ-free mice with norovirus, it restores their intestinal function. It restores the morphology. Here's the infection in the middle. And it restores the T cells. This is amazing. So bacteria do this. We know bacteria are important for morphological development of the gut, for immune development of the gut for many other things, but we didn't know that a virus could do this as well. So we have many, many different viruses in our gut, and it's likely that a lot of them contribute to functions such as this. Now, you cannot do a study like this in people, but lots of people do take antibiotics that deplete their gut flora, so we can begin to ask whether uh, having a viral infections do anything uh, in these individuals. So lots of interesting experiments to be done. So that's just an introduction to this field before we talk about some details. And the point is that virology and viruses is, is just an amazing area. And I, as I said, I want to convey my enthusiasm for this to you. But I think maybe more importantly, if you don't care about enthusiasm and passion about a subject, and that's fine, virology is an integrative science. That means when you learn virology, you have to learn everything. You have to learn biochemistry, molecular biology, cell biology, physiology. If you want to talk about disease, you have to learn epidemiology. You have to learn some ecology to understand how viruses go from animals to people. You, it's not like chemistry where you, you study molecules and how they're put together and taken apart, which is not to disparage chemistry, but this is a way broader topic. And that's why I want a prerequisite for this course, so at least you have some fundamental biology, because we're going to cover a lot of ground in talking about viruses. So I had someone take this course two years ago. She came up to me at the end, and she said, I'm a freshman. I didn't have any biology, and I didn't come talk to you before because I thought you would kick me out of the course. And it turned out she got an A in the course, and she said, her mother was a virologist, so that probably helped. But she said, now I'm ready for biology for advanced biology because this course makes me learn other things. And I think it's, it's good because it makes you learn it in a useful way. You understand biochemistry in terms of what viruses do. So that's what I mean by virology uh, is an integrative science. So here are my course goals. I'm going to show you the big picture of virology. I'm not going to give you details about genes and individual viruses or diseases. It's, it's not about cataloging. It's, it's a principles course. It's to try and teach you how things work in an overview. Of course, along the way, I have to, we have to give you some details. But I'm always interested in you understanding uh, the big picture. Okay, not, not simply, that's why we don't teach this virus by virus. I want you to understand an overview, not only of how viruses replicate, but in the end, at the second half of the course, we'll talk about how they cause disease and how, they, how you can prevent that. So you're gonna understand a lot of fundamentals and I think most people are afraid of viruses because they simply don't understand them. All right, that's what I mean by frighten the uninformed. We've just gone through and are still going through an Ebola virus outbreak of massive proportions in, in Western Africa, as you probably know. 
and most of the press about it has not been bad, but there's been a lot of incorrect stuff, and peop many people are afraid. For example, we had an, an ER physician at Columbia come back from volunteering uh, in Africa, and he developed Ebola infection while he was here in New York. It's a 21-day incubation period. And the night before he was diagnosed, he was in Brooklyn bowling with his buddies. And, you know, this city went nuts over that. I got tons of phone calls asking me if they should stay home, right, if this was going to infect the entire city. So this reflects a lack of understanding of what's going on. That's what I want to supply you with. So the next outbreak you'll be able to read and understand, yeah, this is not a big deal or this is what is going on. I've had many former students email me years later saying, you know, there's this outbreak this year and I really understand it because I took your course. So that's really my goal. Let me give you an example of this. This is a, ca a screen capture from a, a CNN broadcast a number of years ago. In 2009, we had a new strain of influenza virus emerged which caused a pandemic. That means it spreads globally and infects uh, many millions of people. So this was a new strain. And CNN was reporting on an animal study in this broadcast. And this was a study where people had infected ferrets with the virus. And they found that uh, the virus spread to the lungs, uh, caused lesions. They were presenting this as if this is what was going to happen in people. All right? Because most people assume that when you do an animal study, that the same results apply to humans. And this is simply not true. And I think most science journalists don't understand this. You do animal studies to understand principles, which then you have to validate in people. And yet in this broadcast, they were saying swine flu is going to be terrible because it's killing these animals. Actually, I don't even think they mentioned the animal study here. But it turned out that the, the virus was actually quite mild in people. And the ferret study didn't predict what was happening at all. So I always you like to use this as an example of how you cannot trust the media to portray what's accurately going on in science. And that will be, we'll come back to this over and over. And I'm sure things will happen during this course. Some infectious disease issues will rise up and I'll bring them up and tell you uh, what's good or what's not good about them. All right, so let's take a uh, break and do a question here. All right, which statement is true? All viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at any given time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting. I know there's some reporters out there. It's not, don't take it personally, okay? And our immune system cannot handle most viral infections. All right, our immune system can manage most viral infections. It's absolutely correct. Uh, another one, a few people answered C. Humans are usually infected with one Actually, they're infected with more than one. You have at least a dozen and probably more. Uh, the press is usually correct. You d it must be the reporters out there who answered that, right? Or else you just want to uh, mess with me, which people do every year. It's fine. So what is a virus? That's the, the title of this lecture. This is my definition, which has actually changed over the years from when I started. An infectious, obligate, intracellular parasite. It has genetic material. can be DNA or RNA. And it has some kind of coat. It's got a protein coat. And sometimes on top of the protein, it has a lipid shell or a membrane as well. But the key here is infectious obligate intracellular parasite. And those are pictures of some various viruses that we'll talk about during this course. You can see they come in different sizes and shapes and configurations. Because they are obligate intracellular parasites, so that means they have to get inside of a cell to multiply. A virus particle sitting on the table will do nothing. It has to get inside of a cell. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. So when you study viruses, you learn by default about the host cell as well. And so many fundamental discoveries about what goes on in cells have been made in virus-infected cells for this reason. For example, Splicing of mRNA precursors was discovered in virus-infected cells. And that's in part because many years ago, when people were starting to study uh, these issues, viruses presented simple systems that they could study. You could purify lots of nucleic acids and get reagents to work with. It's less true now, but still many discoveries continue be, to be made uh, in a virus-infected cell. Now, an interesting question which you may be thinking about is, are viruses living or not? 
And on my blog, I put up a poll, um, which you can see the results of here. And you can see that they are split between yes and no and something in between. Uh, those were some of the choices as well as I don't know, a few people uh, didn't know. So are they living or not? Well, this is also something that I've thought about a lot over the years and I've changed my thinking about it. And it really depends on semantics. It, it depends on what you mean by virus. So when I say virus, I don't mean the virus particle, which I showed pictures of you, to you before. I mean an organism. And in particular, I mean an organism that has two phases. And you all probably, when you say virus, you mean the virus particle. But try and think of it as an organism with two phases. There's the virus particle, with, which is one phase, where we call it a virion as well. A virion means simply an infectious virus particle. But then the other phase is the infected cell. And this is obligate. It has to happen if the virus is going to reproduce and endure. The infected cell, of course, is living. The cell is living, and the virus is simply modifying it and changing its priorities. But it's living. A virus-infected cell is living. So I say a virus is certainly living because it has these two phases. The virus particle is not living. Of course, it's just a mixture of chemicals of various sorts and doesn't do anything until it gets into a cell. So the virus particle is inanimate, but the infected cell is living. And this comprises this organism called a virus uh, that has, and you can, you can easily see, for example, you could compare a virion to a spore, which is not living, but then under the right conditions it becomes living. So that's my definition. You're, of course, welcome to have your own because there's no, I would never ask you on a test, is a virus living or not? But this is simply my interpretation of the issue. Now, as we progress through this course, I want to have you try and not use anthropomorphic terms to refer to viruses. And there's a specific reason for that. So for example, a common one is uh, this virus is trying to get into the cell. Or this, this virus believes it can evade the immune system. All these human uh, words that we commonly use in everyday living don't use them for viruses. Here there's some more. They don't think. Many people I hear talking about viruses, thinking they can do something, employ, ensure, exhibit, etc. And there's a reason for this. That is because when you use these words, you are ascribing human values to what a virus is doing. And we really don't have any clue what, why a virus is, is responding in a certain way. You know, you can apply an antiviral drug to a virus population and select resistant mutants. And some people will say the virus is trying to uh, evade the antiviral. How do you know that? In fact, it's just a passive activity. Viruses are chemicals that undergo reactions just like everything else, and there's no intent. So if you don't think of human terms in describing viruses, you'll be more neutral in the way that you look at their biology. You'll look at them as organisms passing through phases, and I think you'll be less biased in understanding what, what's going on. And there'll be some times throughout the course where we'll point this out, okay? And so it's not just a fussy thing that I don't want you to talk about viruses thinking. It's really to help you view a virus in a neutral way without any human uh, influences. Okay, next question, right. Which of the following most correctly defines a virus? An obligate intracellular parasite, an obligate intracellular co-symbiont, an obligate extracellular parasite, a non-obligate intracellular parasite, or maybe none of the above. All right, it's, they are obligate <coughs> intracellular parasites. Everything else is, they're not co-symbionts. I don't even know what a co-symbiont is. They're symbionts or not symbionts. So they're not symbionts. Um, they're not extracellular parasites, of course, and they are not non-obligate. They have to be inside the cell, which is what uh, A is. <clears throat> and that's an important point, and that's something that you need to understand because um, it's key to understanding how viruses work. All right, so, y yes? Uh, well, you mentioned before that viruses can exhibit non-necessarily uh, antagonistic sure, uh, sure. behaviors towards yeah. the host. Um, how does that differentiate it from being naturally obligated, ob obligatorily parasitic? Right. So this, this question really refers to 
um, a, a virus in a cell, a single cell. What you're talking about is absolutely true. So, so an organism may not be negatively influenced, or may be benefited by the presence of the virus. But the fundamental, the most, the lowest definition of a virus in a cell is that it's an intracellular parasite. Okay, and that being a parasite implies that there's some damage to the host cell, which is not actually 100% true. There are many viruses that will replicate in cells and not damage them at all. But sometimes you have to apply a term to the whole, to the whole mix of viruses. Make sense? Okay. I, I had a feeling that might come up. All right. The other, um, the other part of the virus definition that we used to have is that viruses were very small. So they are pretty small still, but not as much as we thought. So here's a, a figure that will illustrate this. Uh, here's a bacterium at the lower left. It's E. coli, 100,000 times magnified. And there's a bacteriophage of E. coli for size. You can tell how big it is. And here is a virion of HIV-1 in uh, its panel D. So it's pretty big compared to the phage. In this panel, oh, so below this, this rod-like structure, this is actually a virus called tobacco mosaic virus, the first virus to be discovered that we'll talk about in a moment. And then this smaller panel has a number of things that we can't see. So we're going to expand it here. And now this is blown up a million times. So you can see um, A is a carbon atom. So that's about the right size. It's probably too big because the ink can't be made small enough, right? And here's a uh, tRNA. Uh, here's an antibody molecule, a ribosome. And here's a virus, one of the smaller viruses. This is the virus on my cell phone. It's a polio virus. It's about the size of a ribosome. And you can see some cellular molecules, uh, myosin and actin, and some enzymes that are quite large inside the cell. So this gives you uh, an idea of the relative size of viruses. They are quite small. You can't, you can't see most of them without an electron microscope. Here's another image to put it in perspective with a eukaryotic cell. That was a bacterial cell. So here's a eukaryotic cell. And there are two different kinds of viruses. Uh, right next to it here is a herpes virus, the bigger one. And then the smaller ones are, again, uh, polio viruses. And that's all this is expanded here. So you can see the herpes virus and the polio. Herpes is 200 nanometers in diameter. So it's still much smaller than the cell. And polio about uh, 10 times smaller, 30 nanometers or so. Uh, and again, about the size of ribosomes, as I told you before. So viruses are small. And there's the old question, how many viruses can you put on a pinhead? This is actually from a nice animation you can find online where it's a movie that starts out far away and then zooms in on this pinhead. And this is a, a, a single strand of hair. Uh, this, is, this guy in pink is a dust mite. And then in, next to the dust mite in a box are a variety of things which you can't see. They're blown up at right. And you can see this red blood cells. Um, I think this is a yeast cell in blue. This is a, a grain of pollen. This is a lymphocyte. And then here uh, you have um, some bacteria in green and yellow, and then the viruses are there. There's a Ebola virus, the long guy, uh, and some other viruses as well. So you could put 500 million rhinoviruses uh, onto the head of a pin. And every time, if you have a rhinovirus infection, which causes common cold, every time you sneeze, you're expelling many, many viruses, which then go on to infect other people. Now, here's a very nice picture, which illustrates that we had no clue that there were huge viruses out there a number of years ago. 2011, earlier than that actually, this new virus, Mimi virus, was discovered. And it's huge. It's 750 nanometers in diameter. For comparison, here's rhinovirus, 30 nanometers, uh, HIV slightly larger. So these were the biggest viruses discovered. You can see they're also hairy, which is kind of interesting. It probably helps them to attach to cells. And on the right uh, is a cell infected with Mimi virus. Those are the two Mimi virus particles here can see the, the hair around them. And here is a, a different virus infecting the same cell. This, to date, to the point at which Mimi virus had been discovered, was thought to be the largest uh, known virus. You can see that it's dwarfed by Mimi virus. So these viruses are 750 nanometers and bigger. After Mimi virus was discovered, people went nuts and started looking everywhere for big viruses. And this is one of the others that was discovered a couple of years ago, it's called Pandora virus. This, this on the left is a photograph taken in a light microscope. All right? You just go into the lab and you put a slide on the scope and look in. You can see these viruses. They're two microns long, 2,000 nanometers. 
biggest so far discovered. And they have this very interesting flask-like shape, which is shown here in a photograph, artificially colored. And here's a diagram of it. It has a very large DNA genome. These DNA genomes are huge. They're over one to two million bases long. And it's called Pandora virus, by the way, because it's flask-like. You know, the, the old legend of Pandora opening a box. She actually didn't open a box. She opened a flask. But all the paintings have her show her opening a box. And so this was obviously named by people who are into history. So there are lots of big viruses now that we've discovered. We're going to talk about them later, what they do and what they mean. It's really fascinating. Now, the way viruses replicate is completely different from everything else. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of discovery in a moment, but when viruses were discovered, we already knew about bacteria. And we knew that if you take a bacteria, a single bacterium, and put it in a broth, a nutrient broth, it'll start to divide. It'll divide by binary fission. From one, you get two, and then you get four and eight, and so on. And if you plot the growth of bacteria, uh, you get logarithmic growth until the medium is exhausted. When people first discovered viruses, they assumed that they would grow in the same way, but it turned out it was wrong. They don't divide by binary fission. Uh, because when you infect a cell with a virus, there's a, there's a long period of time where nothing happens. You don't see any new virus particles. Whereas with the bacteria, you put it in broth, and if the temperature's right, it starts to divide. And that's because viruses get into a cell and they make the parts to assemble new virus particles. So the viral genome is used to direct the synthesis of proteins, and eventually they assemble to form new virus particles, and that's why you need a little bit of time. And then, when all the particles are made, they burst out of the cell. So it's not binary fission. You make the parts and assemble the final product. And we'll talk about this product in a separate lecture, this whole assembly product uh, process, which is really uh, fascinating. But a key point that viruses are really different from bacteria. Which of the following is true concerning bacterial versus viral replication? Viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria do not replicate via binary fission as viruses do. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. Viruses do not have an eclipse period. Viruses replicate by binary fission. Right. Viruses assemble using preformed components. It's absolutely essential. Uh, bacteria do not. They divide. They don't make preformed components, right? They simply divide. Although you could argue that the DNA is being divided before division occurs, but it's, uh, it's really the point is to emphasize that viruses are different. They don't replicate by binary fission. They replicate by making the parts and assembling new particles. How old are they? probably the first things to arise on Earth. Now you may say, wait a minute, you're saying that viruses are intracellular parasites. How could they be on Earth before cells? Well, we probably nucleic acids evolved that could simply replicate in the organic broth that was present on Earth. And these were probably RNA molecules. You've probably heard of the RNA world. This was thought to be the first uh, molecular uh, era on the Earth, and it's a long time ago. But probably virus, or not viruses, but I would say replicating nucleic acids resembling viruses arose during that time. And we'll, show, we'll, we'll talk about some evidence for that that we have today. So viruses are quite old. We have evidence that they infected dinosaurs, but that's nowhere near as old as they uh, probably are. They probably arose a long time ago. There are records of virus infections throughout history. As soon as people began to record history, uh, this, this Greek pot from 700 BC talks about a rabid person. Uh, and here's a, an Egyptian carving showing a young man with what we think is, is the leg paralysis typical of polio. So all throughout history, you can find references to diseases that seem to be viral uh, diseases. Uh, in the 11th century, the process of variolation was practiced first by the Chinese. They saw that people who got smallpox, if they survived, never got infected again or never got the disease again. They didn't know it was an infection. They didn't know it was a virus. So variolation was the practice of taking the pustule from someone who had recovered from smallpox, grinding it up and blowing it into the nose of another person. And they found that this would protect many of them. Unfortunately, about 20% of them die, uh, but the rest are protected. And so this practice was used for many years. Um, and they did it without knowing the agent and, and simply observing that people who survived were protected. Now this lady here is Lady Montague, 
who was the wife of the, the British ambassador to Turkey in the 1700s. And she got smallpox but survived. And she heard about this variolation in Turkey. So she went back to England and spread the word. And they started practicing that there as well. But uh, it wasn't until the 1790s that Edward Jenner uh, did experiments that established the real process of vaccination, that is to use a virus that doesn't cause disease to immunize you. And we'll talk about this in a separate lecture. So still, in, if we come to the 16, 1800s, we still don't have viruses. Uh, Leuvenhoek, uh, of course, made the first microscopes, and he discovered that there were microbiological forms of life, which we didn't know by then. Louis Pasteur said that these microbes, he showed that these microbes reproduce. They don't arise by spontaneous generation. They reproduce. They divide by binary fission. And uh, Robert Koch on the right there showed that these microbes, these bacteria, can cause disease. He developed the well-known Koch's postulates to prove that a particular bacterium can cause uh, a disease. But still, no viruses. None of these individuals uh, ever worked with or discussed viruses. And that happened towards the end of the 1800s. And the first viral disease that was studied was this one called tobacco mosaic disease. This is a tobacco leaf which is infected with the virus. Tobacco back then was a big deal. It was an important agricultural crop because people liked to smoke. And if, they, if this disease arose, the, the leaves were not usable. So people were trying to figure out what was causing it. And so they followed the lead of Pasteur and Koch and tried to find a, a bacteria that was causing the disease. And the way you did that was to take the leaf and grind it up in a buffer and then put it through a filter, a filter that had pores of 0.2 microns in size. That would retain all the bacteria, let everything else go through. And they would take the filter and put it in broth and grow up the bacteria and try and infect the plants and produce the disease. The problem was the agent didn't remain on the filter. It went through the filter into the broth. So here's an example of these early filters. They're made of porcelain, and the pore size was about 0.2 microns. You would pass the extract through them, uh, and the material would pass through. And the agent of tobacco disease did never stayed on the filter. It went down here in the broth. So in 1892, Ivanovsky uh, in Russia and Beyerink a few years later in Holland found that this agent of this disease passed through a filter. And so they thought it was different from bacteria. They called it contagium vivium fluidum and eventually gave it the name virus, which is from the Latin meaning slimy liquid uh, or poison. So that's the first virus to be discovered. The first animal dis virus discovered 1898 was the agent of foot and mouth disease. Again, they showed you could transmit this agent to cattle, which causes lesions on the mouth and on, on the feet. You can make an extract would pass through a filter and you could inoculate cattle and give them uh, the disease. So the key concept here was that they were small, passed through a 0.2 micron filter, but also they would only replicate in the host. These individuals all tried to put these agents in a broth, but they would never multiply. They required a host in which to uh, multiply. Now the key here was for many years, this was the standard part of a definition for viruses, it passes through a 0.2 micron filter. But you know now that this doesn't hold. These Mimi viruses are 750 uh, nanometers in diameter. They would never uh, pass through this filter. And the Pandora virus, of course, wouldn't as well. So that's why we've changed our definition of a virus. They're still quite small, uh, but um, not as small as we thought. So from those early years, then virus discovery was driven by understanding human illness, for the most part. So you see first human virus in 1901, yellow fever, rabies virus, variola or smallpox virus, uh, a, a leukemia virus of chicken and polio virus, um, Rouse sarcoma virus, another virus that caused tumors in chickens, very important discoveries we'll talk about later, bacteriophages, and influenza virus. So, and for many years, driven by uh, trying to understand uh, human disease. Okay, which is a key concept first discovered about viruses that distinguish them from other microorganisms. Too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. They could replicate only in broth. They made tobacco plants sick. They were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter, or maybe none of them. Right, small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. So some of you answered one or A, B, or C. Um, they're not too large. We now know they are too large to pass through a point net 0.2 micron, but originally, the original definition was that they would pass through it. 
Um, they, viruses do not replicate in broth, only bacteria do that. And making tobacco plants sick is not a fundamental uh, key property of viruses. It's how they were first discovered, of course, but it, um, it doesn't matter that it happened to be tobacco. In the 1940s, in 30s, 1930s and 40s, the electron microscope was developed. And finally, people could look at virus particles. And here's what they saw. For many years, people thought they were still a fluid substance, even though they were infectious and passed through a filter. A lot of people didn't believe that. And here was the first evidence that they were particulate in nature. Here's a bacteriophage, wonderful looking particles with, with an icosahedral head, a neck, and these wonderful tails. Uh, sticking out. Here is tobacco mosaic virus, the one that was first discovered that we've just talked about. It's a rod-like extended particle. Here's rabies virus on the lower left. And finally, uh, on the right there is a rotavirus, a vi another human virus that causes gastroenteritis. And so since then, we've been able to look at many, many viruses. And more recently, we can solve the structure of these viruses by x-ray crystallography or cryo-electron microscopy, two really powerful techniques which were used for proteins for many years, well, x-ray crystallography, but someone figured out how to get it to work with big particles like viruses. So this is the x-ray crystal structure of poliovirus. You can trace the alpha carbon of all the protein chains. And here is the cryo-EM structure, which is a, a little lower resolution. And these are big molecules. So this is the structure of poliovirus. And now we know the chemical structure of it. We know the x-ray structure. Where we know where everything is in three dimensions. Of course, these images are made on a computer using coordinates, three-dimensional coordinates developed uh, by these structural techniques. So we classify viruses. Now today we know thousands and thousands of different viruses. So a long time ago it was realized we had to have a classification system to put them in order so that we would understand relationships and study them more effectively. And so the original classification of viruses was based on these uh, four categories, the nature and sequence of the nucleic acid, so whether it's DNA or RNA. Unlike us, viruses can have RNA as genomes. It can be single or double-stranded, linear or circular, in pieces or in one molecule. The protein shell, what's the symmetry? How is it built? Is there a lipid? Is there an envelope around the particle? And how big is it? Because size did matter for viruses. Nowadays, we only use one criteria to classify a virus, and that's the sequence of the nucleic acid. And so sequencing genomes and the bioinformatics used to analyze the sequences has advanced to a point now where we can get a sequence from an individual of a virus and immediately assign it to one of the pre-existing families that we already have. And as you'll see, when we say I took uh, water from the, the, the lake in Central Park and I sequenced it, I would find a lot of viruses that we know of, but 90% of the viral sequence would be unknown. It wouldn't look like anything. We call it dark matter. It's probably viral, but we simply haven't discovered it yet. And so there's a lot out there that we can't classify. We use this method of classifying viruses. We're going to be using some of these names throughout the course, so I want you to be familiar with them. We use the classical hierarchical system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The blue ones are what are used for viruses. We don't go above the order. And mostly we'll be talking about virus families. So for example, the Ebola viruses are classified in a family called the Filoviridae. So viridae is the, is the suffix you put on family names. Or you could say phylovirus family. And these, of course, are the famous, iconic filamentous Ebola viruses. The genus level is Ebola virus. One word. Ebola, of course, is a river, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and if you want to talk about the virus, you have to use Ebola virus. And all the newspapers just say Ebola outbreak, Ebola vaccine. Ebola, this, which is not right because it's a river. It's not a virus, right? So the genus is Ebola virus. There's another genus uh, in the Filo virus, the Marburg virus, which is another virus that causes hemorrhagic fever. And then there are five different species of Ebola viruses. The most famous is Zaire Ebola virus. It was first isolated uh, in, it was called DRC at the time, and then Zaire, and then DR DRC back again. And um, this one you call Zaire Ebola virus, one word. 
there's also Sudan and Reston and a couple of others as well. So that's the classification order, and we'll use lots of these names in this course, so just familiarize yourself for, for how they work. Now many people, ba driven by technology, go out into the environment and try and find new viruses. As we'll see in a bit, sequencing technology has progressed enormously. We can now do very rapid and very deep sequencing. So we can take, for example, water. Here's an example of a team that went to Antarctica. They went to a freshwater lake, uh, drilled a hole through the ice and got samples of the water. They brought it back to the lab and sequenced, his, sequenced all the viruses that were in it. And you can do this now. When I was first training, you couldn't do this. You would be happy if you could sequence one viral genome. And when, in this case, which is Lake Limnopolar, they found 10,000 new virus species from 12 different families. And of course, they found lots of sequences that didn't match up with anything, which are unknown viruses and remain to be characterized. You can go just about anywhere on Earth and do this. It's been done a lot for the oceans. Uh, Craig Venter went around the world on his ship and sampled the, the ocean water and sequenced that. And you can see all of that sequence information online on a database. But you can go to lakes and rivers, fresh and salt water areas. You can do this on land as well. You can take soil. You can take animals out in the wild and look at their virome. So this is uh, a new science that's arisen by trying to understand what is out there in terms of viruses. And I tell you this because we, we can discover thousands and thousands of viruses every day by doing this. You're only limited by uh, the people who can do the work and, and analyze it as well. So this is a huge new field of virology. We'll talk about it quite a bit. Uh, it's important for pathogen discovery as well. If someone gets sick and they don't have any of the known viruses, you can sequence what's in them and find out what's there. And we'll talk about examples of that as well. It's very, very exciting. So I've told you a lot of general principles about viruses, and I focused a lot on the numbers and the fact that they don't make you sick. And you may be saying, why do I care about any of this? Well, here are just some bullet points to emphasize why you should care. First of all, viruses outnumber cellular life by at least 10 to 1. So just by numbers, they're important, and we have to figure out what they're doing. They have the greatest biodiversity on Earth. Nothing comes close. There are more different kinds of viruses infecting uh, different hosts than hosts themselves. As I told you, they drive global cycles. We talked about the oceans a little bit, and we'll get back to that in a, in a later lecture. I think they're beneficial. I've given you just one example in the mouse on how a norovirus can be beneficial. But those uh, viruses integrated into our DNA, I'm going to tell you examples later on of how they help us. Um, you wouldn't be here if not for those viruses. And finally, of course, they're sources of new pathogens. I think this often drives the research in virology, but as I said, it's a minor part of what's out there. So these are just some of the ideas and topics that we're going to touch upon in the, in, the, in the rest of this course. It's divided into two parts. We're going to spend the first half understanding how viruses work, how they get into cells and duplicate themselves, and then the second part, uh, we're going to talk about disease. And so here, I'll leave you with this one slide, an underlying simplicity. There are lots of viruses, and you may start to think, wow, do I have to memorize all of these? Uh, do I have to know all the structures? Well, it turns out that you can simplify. You can reduce this to two points. All viral genomes are parasites that can only function when they get in the cell. And that gives you a commonality among all the viruses to understand how they work. And secondly, and this is what we will exploit next time, all viruses have to make mRNA that can be translated by the ribosome of the host. No virus can translate its own mRNA. It's, they are all absolutely dependent uh, on the host, and therefore they have to make mRNA that the host ribosome can recognize. And that'll be a great way for you to put order to all of these diverse viruses. Mm -hmm.